hi. This is, I'm, <laughs> Once you know it's for real, I know. you're like, uh, 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 uh. Hi, I'm Kirsten Jones. And I'm Susie Walton. And this is our podcast, hashtag Raising Athletes with Kirsten and Susie. Our passion is supporting parents and raising not only strong athletes, but extraordinary people. Join us each week as we tackle all topics youth sports, including everything from early specialization and overuse injuries, to helping our kids feel empowered and learn how to advocate for themselves, not only in the classroom and on the court, but at dinner tables and in their communities. We'll be talking to coaches, athletes, parents, and anyone else who will speak to us (laughs) about their experiences with youth sports and their paths to success. And even more importantly, their failures. Yes, we're going to get into the gritty details of what went wrong so that we can all learn from it, teach our kids and ourselves how to do better next time. Because in the words of Maya Angelou, when you know better, you do better. So welcome to Raising Athletes, because we love to win too. Let's do this. Welcome to the Raising Athletes podcast. My name is Kirsten Jones. I'm a peak performance and sports parenting coach. I love helping parents, athletes, coaches, everyone who's affecting and involved in youth sports figure out what's holding us back, what we're doing well, what we can do better. And I have such a special guest on today. In fact, when I started this podcast five years ago, I put together my list of my top 100. I called it my dream 100 guests. And this guest today was at the very top of that list. Marcelo Balboa is a USA Hall of Fame soccer player, a San Diego State alum, uh, you know, soccer player as well, two-time All-American in 88 and 89. He played uh, pro at the Colorado Rapids, also overseas. We're going to talk about all of his experience as a child, as, as a pro athlete, as a parent, And then as a coach, because he's worn all the hats. In fact, he wears even a different hat now and for the last 25 years of being a broadcaster. So, Cello, I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for making the time. Oh, anytime. Are you kidding me? I've been waiting for this. I knew I was like on the list, like 99, 100. So you finally, I saw saw you like at 90 podcasts. So I'm like 91, I think so. I made the 100. <laughs> That's not true. You were at the top. I was like, I, I had to hold out till I showed showed you I was legit. Because you know, I'm not I'm not on the TV. I'm just doing oh, my little it, show over here. <laughs> hey, uh, your show is awesome. I'll leave it at that. So I'm just glad I'm 91. Rock on. I made it under 100. And <laughs> you're, you're awesome. As you can well, see, I, we went to college together. You yeah. know, we're good. Well, I want to tell the story. I was thinking about this this morning, actually. Um, I remember meeting you so clear as day, a kid, girl from Montana with barely matching knee pads who walked on at San Diego State and and by dumb luck. And these are one of those things that parents who you are having your child, either high school or college. But one of honestly, the best memories I had was that the women's Uh, volleyball team and the men's soccer team hung out. Right. Yep. yep. <laughs> so all the time. We, too much. Too much. <laughs> too much. We pretty much had our whole social schedule planned yeah. around each other, yep. right? <laughs> it was, uh, you know, whenever you guys had a game, we would show up, and we had games, you guys would show up, and then we'd hang out after. So yeah, it was. Uh, it was. You know what? It was a. For me, it was a, a great way to meet new people because I didn't go. I went to junior college first. And did my job there because I struggled in school and then ended up going to San Diego State. And uh, it was a big jump from a junior college to a four year. But uh, you guys definitely made it easier for me. So let's I want to talk all about state, but let's start. Can we start at the beginning? And you're the son of of Argentinian immigrants, right? So can we hear your family's story? I love hearing where we came from. And then we'll get into you getting into soccer. Yeah, well... um, Pops was playing in Argentina, and he was playing for Argentina Junior and Comunicaciones. Uh, he had an opportunity to come here, I believe it was in 65, 60, no, 66, I think it was, and to play professional soccer. So he wanted a better life for, his, for him and my mom. I, they were married. 
mom stayed back in Argentina for a year. I think it was 65 then. She came out in 66, 67. My brother was born in 66. I was born in 67. And um, it was just, you know, he wanted something different, a better life. Uh, went back to Argentina after his stint with the Chicago Mustangs, which down the road, you'll find out that the, the guy that he played with ended up being the coach of the 90 World Cup team and Bob Gansler. And I didn't find out about that until much later on. Then I had some good stories about my dad. And, uh, but uh, yeah, he didn't like that. He never told me, I'll be honest with you. He never told me he knew Bob Ganser until after I was named to the 90 World Cup team. And then he had proceeded to tell me. But the only thing he didn't know is that Bob Ganser, on the day that he said I was making the World Cup team, told me some stories and told me that about my dad. So I, that's where I kind of found out about that. But ended up going back to Argentina for three years, coming back. To, to the United States and playing in uh, the San Pedro Yugoslavs in California, up in the mountains um, in San Pedro. My dad worked for Star Kiss Tuna. He played on Sundays in a semi-pro league. Um, Did he make any money playing? I, do you um, remember what, what the... Back then, it was, it, was, it was play on Sundays. They gave him a job uh, okay. to be a machinist. He played on Sundays. And then from there, um, he ended up moving into Star Kiss Tuna. So the tuna you see now, he used to make those cans. He worked as a machinist, and little by little, he dragged us out there. We'd go watch him play on Sundays, and then little by little, when we were 15, and uh, listen, we, if you go through the, the high school now and college rules, we would have been eligible because we played. I was 15, 16, and I was playing in a Sunday uh, amateur league up in the mountains about an hour away from home. So oh, wow. my dad wanted to put us in a situation where – we were uncomfortable. We weren't the best players. And uh, I'm telling you, my you're, first You're playing against the men. I'm playing against 30-something-year-old men. Yeah, and I'm yeah. 16, 16, I think it was, 16, 17, right in there. And my first experience was watching some dude. Uh, we're watching the game before us. And let me remind you, it's up in the mountains. It's like a high school field. It's a dirt field. The guy goes up and heads the ball. And this dude, you see the defender waiting for him. He throws an elbow up. The guy cuts his tongue off. And that was my first experience before we played. So my dad just wanted us to put us in a, in a situation that, uh, that was uncomfortable. Mm. And to have to defend yourself as a 16, 15-year-old against ex-pros, semi-pro guys, um, it was a learning experience. So, but my dad came back. He played semi-pro. He worked. He worked the graveyard uh, at Starkest Tuna. We'd come home from school. He would, uh, he would be just getting up. He would take us out. It was basically homework would be afterward. But my dad would get us, me and my brother. We'd go out every day and train with my dad. And listen, and how do you say it? My dad was an ass. My dad was really? an ass. But my dad knew the potential we had, okay? Mm -hmm. So he wasn't going to let us sit around and let that potential go. We were lucky enough in high school. Listen, in high school... I played baseball, I played soccer, I played football, and uh, if it wasn't for sports, uh, I probably would have, I, yeah, I would have failed. I would have dropped out. I would have had to have because my grades were horrible. And the only way I could keep my grades up was knowing that I could play sports. So my, me and my C average were right there. So, but Pops was- Was your brother as talented as you? My brother, believe it or not, was uh, more talented than me. My brother, at one point, he was probably one of the best players in high school. Very skillful, very good on the ball. Um, the only problem my brother had is he didn't have the passion of the heart that I did. And my mentality was different. My mentality was my brother was better than me, so I had to run more. My brother was a better dribbler, so I tackled more. I jumped higher. So I worked on everything that I could, but it was still always my brother. My brother was the my brother. My dad always said, "If there's a brick wall, and I put the ball on the other side of the of the wall, your brother will navigate somehow, some way. He'll find a way around the wall to get to the ball." He goes, "You, the donkey, will run right through the freaking wall to get to the ball right there." And it's true. That's just who I was. So it was. Um, it was fun because I got to play with my brother in high school, and uh, he You're was just, just one fun great to apart. watch. He one great apart, yeah. 
Yeah. So he was a senior, I was a junior, and I got to play three years with him. And when he left, it was a uh, completely different story. Because Cerritos High School. You were Cerritos High School. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it was fun. Listen, I if, yeah. I had a, I had a big brother who defended me. I broke my jaw because we were playing our rival high school, and the coach basically put in the biggest guy and said, "Go get him." And my brother told me, "Be careful." So I went up for a header, and I was, as soon as I came down, the dude threw an elbow and just broke my jaw, fracture and fractured. And my brother ran over there and just started beating the shit out of him because oh, wow. the guy didn't even play. The guy was just out to hurt me. Mm. So it was nice to have that. But, mm. man, he was, he was a freaking good player. What a good player he was. I just, I just had a bigger heart, man. I had a bigger heart. I had more passion for what I wanted to do. And uh, he, and where did that he come just from? Good. That's just how you were born. That's how you no, were. No, I don't. I, I think. Listen, I think we're all given a gift. We're all given a gift. You, if you're lucky enough to find that gift and what it is, um, you're you're very blessed. I was blessed enough to realize I could play soccer. My dad saw it, and my dad always put me. I always played an age up. I played with my brother. and never played my age. Um, even when we started off. At 10, 11, I always played with my brother. It was never my brother playing with the 11s and me playing with the 10s. I always played with my brother. And, uh, and your dad with older coached guys. you? My dad coached. And my dad, I tell you, my dad okay. was the toughest coach. I mean, I remember we used to sit in the back of the car with my brother, and there were three speeches. One, A, you were horrible today. I don't know what you guys were doing. B was, you did okay, but you still suck. And then C was very rare. You had a good game today, and you should be proud of yourself. That was a tough one. My dad was tough love. But I'll be honest with you, if it wasn't for the way he treated me, and listen, as a kid, you doubt, does he really love me or is he just pushing me to be an athlete? And I know my dad loved me. I knew he did, but he pushed me and pushed me to the point where he kicked me off his team because I got decently good at a certain age and I got a little too arrogant and cocky. And my dad said, bye bye. So he kicked me off his team, wouldn't let me go to practice, wouldn't let me do anything for almost three weeks. And he's like, go find another team, you'll be fine. And uh, so he, I, I learned my lesson about humility and about, you know, we all have good days and bad days, but when you have a good day, you should treat it just like you had a bad day. You move on and you work harder. So, but if it wasn't for him, I, listen, I, I made ODP at 18. Mm -hmm. um, I played in three World Cups, like, like you said earlier, I went to college on a full scholarship. I played professional soccer. I've had ups and downs in my career. I tore my ACL. You, you name it, I've had it. And I've always found a way to fight through that and to find a way to persevere no matter what in life happened. Because listen, not every coach, <clears throat> not every coach likes you. You know, we went, so I, we I... went at 18. We went at 18 to Colorado Springs. And we're playing with the Western, with the Western ODP team, we'll say. And we're playing a sports festival, north, south, east, and west, all are there. So we're all trying to make the under-20 national team. So the under-20 coach sends a message that he's not going to be there, but they're going to videotape all the games. And the team he picks will get to go to Russia. Imagine, I'm 18 now. I'm thinking to myself, all right, I got a shot here. Scored three goals as a center back. We won the tournament. And the coach took the exact same team that he took to the ter previous tournament, didn't take any new players. So um, what do you do? You give up or you keep fighting? You know what I mean? So you just got to fight. So I have a lot of parents who come up to me talking about a similar situation to your dad had. Maybe yeah. didn't play at that high a level, but the dad is super intense. Yeah. And yeah. the mom says... What do I do? So what role did your mom play? And how did that, as the kid, how did that work? Like, how did you feel in that situation? Um, listen, dad was the ex-professional player, right? Yeah. So mom's role was to be the loving mom. My mom was very supportive. Um, when my dad wasn't around, she's like, you know what? Your dad's just trying to push you to be better. He wants you to work hard. He never wants you to give up. So mom was the balance, you know what I mean? Because the scale was really leaning towards my dad and my mom would have to work hard to put it back. So it bounced because you got to have a good balance between mom and dad. And uh, mom was there. 
bad day, good day. Mom give you a hug. She tells you she loves you and you'll fight. Uh, you'll live to fight another day. And that's what mom would do. And, uh, and it, you know, listen, not everybody has a dad who's an ex-pro. And yeah. ex-pro, and I, said, I, I did it myself. And, and we can talk about that later. I ex-pro who coached this kid, who pushed this kid away from his sport because he thought that his kid should be able to do what I did, which is not even close. But you learn that throughout life. But mom was the, the balancing act. If it wasn't for mom, um, yeah, so you, the balance would have been way off. And when you have, when the scales balance way too far one way, um, it, it makes for a very grumpy, very sad. And for kids that just want to give up because they don't, if they can't please their dad or their mom, they give up. And uh, mom was that balance. Do you have any family stories of your mom having to defend you that your mom fought, felt like he pushed you too hard or was she? Um, my dad pushed a, me hard every day. Listen, I wouldn't yeah. be where I'm at if it wasn't for him. And I love okay. him, but I hate him. It's a, it's a hate love relationship because if you want to get somewhere in life, you've got to have a mentor, right? We all have mentors. Mm -hmm. And that mentor, if he's nice on you and gives you a break and lets you get away with things, then you kind of think, okay, maybe I can do that again, or maybe I can do it this way and get away with things. My dad wouldn't let us get away with anything. When it's time to work, we work. My dad would always say to us, if you're going to do something, do it right. Because if not, you're wasting your time. And if you're wasting your time, you're wasting my time and you're wasting other people's time. So as a young kid, I was taught to fight for what I want and don't give up until you get it. There's always a way. There's always a pathway to get to what you want. It's just how hard are you willing to work? God gave me an ability to play soccer. My dad put me in an environment that made me work every day. He would never let me be the best player on a team. He would move me up. So I was never the best player on a team. I always had to work hard to be like my brother, or I had to work harder to be like this other kid who was a year older than me, because I've always wanted to be the best wherever I played. So it made me work hard. So that environment, it just, it just, God, it just brought out this passion in me that I'm like, you know what? I'm going to keep working until I'm better than him. I'm going to keep working until I'm better than him. And uh, little by little, the guys who are given this ability who don't work, guys who are, God, blessed with such skills, but they don't have the heart, they don't have the mentality. Your work rate will catch that talent and surpass that. But once you get there, are you willing to keep doing the work? Or once you get there, are you satisfied? We see a lot of kids who get that, you know, have a good year, a second year, those rookies. Then they get that big million-dollar contract. And then all of a sudden it does, well, I got there. I reached my goal. Now I can relax. You know when I relaxed? I'm 56 and I still haven't relaxed. I still want to be the best. Uh, hell no. Will I let my kids beat me in anything? No chance. No chance. Sunday league, it, please. I still play Sunday like, league. One of the best gifts your father gave you was by pushing you that way was the getting comfortable being uncomfortable muscle. Yeah. So you were always uncomfortable and you were okay with that. And what we see now a lot is parents are trying so hard to take the discomfort away that to your point, these kids know that they're going for something, but they're, they're not really comfortable leaning into that. Well, maybe I won't make it. Well, maybe I won't get to but the top team. It, well, maybe but, I'm not good enough. But is it the kid that's not comfortable or is it mom and dad that's not comfortable? Mm. That, that to me is the question because the kids are always comfortable playing out there and having fun. But are mom and dad comfortable, Johnny or Becky, not being the best player on their team? Mm -hmm. And if they're not, what do they do? They moved them to a team where they're the star again. That, that's my problem. That's great. You can be the star at 50. At, listen, you know how many kids we've seen that, that are some of the best players in the state when I had them at 13? And you're sitting there going, man, we beat everybody in the state. We have a good team. The retention we have of those kids, would, by the time they get to our U18s, was five kids. Oh. Five kids from a group of 20 kids that were able to make the under-18 the under team. Now, because... from there... Again, they stop working. What the, we have, and I've seen it a lot because I get to travel around a lot. I can see a lot. A lot of kids, once they get that badge, once they wear that and they represent that team that they want to represent, and we'll go with the Rapids because I work, I do stuff yeah. for them. Yeah. Once they get it, their work rate goes from here to here. You know, and if the coach doesn't push them every day, their level drops. And you can't have, you cannot have, if you want to be a pro 
And I get in trouble all the time because I treat my 14-year-olds like they're 18. Every day is not good enough. You strive for perfection. You're never going to get there, but you strive for it every day. And when you come to practice, what's your purpose today? Well, coach, it depends on the session. No, 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 no. What is your purpose today? Are you here to improve what today? Through our drills, are you going to get better in passing? Am I going to get better at shooting? Am I going to get better at reading the game? But a lot of kids just go to practice to practice, and they put in their time. You know, uh, I don't see a lot of kids staying afterward and getting extra work. Um, it's very low percentage of those kids that do that. But when I see a kid go to practice without a purpose, it, uh, it, it winds me up. You know, like I tell a kid the other day, I say, here, pass me the ball, and he's 20 yards away. He just kicks it at me, and it's five feet to the left of me. And I looked at him, and I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I go, play me the ball. I go, every pass, every pass, every day counts. You should be working on A to B. That's an opportunity for you to get better, to make a pass to me. And they don't get it sometimes. They don't get it. So it's, it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. But I love the challenge. I love the challenge of, of pushing these kids and to see who can make and who can't. So what's the balance between, because you're mentioning coaches pushing you, versus pushing yourself. I call that extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Yep. Like, do you see this generation of athletes being intrinsically motivated or is it always about only about the carrot and they're going for the <sighs> carrot and when they get it, they drop off? That's a good question. It's a good question because um, when you, you look at this new generation of athletes, they're so freaking talented. It is ridiculous how talented uh, from basketball to baseball to you name it, football, the athleticism, the strength, the build they have compared to when we, where we were playing. <laughs> but most of these kids don't have the work rate. They don't have the mentality. They're playing, you know, when we talk about us, we talk about five days a week you train and you play that one game. A lot of teams play three or four games a week and they train maybe once or twice. And when you see that, how do you get better? How do you get better at a skill when you're not practicing that much? So we emphasize five days a week. We train five days a week and we play on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, they get off. But it gives them an ability for the coach to coach them. Because if you throw them out there, you will see such God-given talent but it's not an individual sport. We have a team sport. You got to learn to work within a team. And if you don't learn to work within a team, then it's easy to pick that player out. And you can just say, thank you very much. I can find another player like that, but this guy's willing to pass. He's willing to work within the team system. And listen, I'm all about allowing the kids to be creative, okay, on the soccer field. They should be creative. They should be able to think for themselves, but they have to do it under my structure. And what I mean by my structure is the club structure of how they want to play. But you have the freedom to allow them to express themselves. A lot of kids want to do that, but they don't know how to do it within the system. So now you find a very talented kid, but he doesn't know how to play with a team. And that, what's more important, an individual or a team? And we know this, being volleyball, you know how important your team is. So... It, 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 like I said, this generation of athletes is, is crazy, but I'm not sure they have the work ethic that we're used to seeing to get to where you need to get. So what's the missing link? <clears throat> why, um, why? God. Million dollar it, question. It could be. It could, well, <laughs> no, but I mean, if we, had the, if we had the one answer, we'd all do it. You know I mean? There's no yeah. one answer. How do we get it? Yeah. It's every coach has their philosophy of how they want to push a kid. I have been probably over the last seven years, I've had parents who have wanted me to get fired. I've had parents who have complained to, to my bosses because I treat them like pros. And you want to listen, my deal is I'm not your friend. I'm your coach. Your job is to impress me every day and win your job on, on practice. And you keep your job on Saturday. So when a kid comes into a game or he goes into youth soccer, we'll say, and mommy and daddy have paid $3,000 for that kid to play, he has to play 50% of the time. Correct? That's just normal. 
with academies where we pay, the rapids pay, you have to earn your spot. And in life, no one's going to give you anything. I didn't get anything. I had to earn everything to get where I mean, I had to earn. I tore stomach muscles. I've had ACL surgery. I've had sports hernias. I fractured my face, ankle surgery, you name it. I've had about nine surgeries and I've had about over 10 concussions. But I've earned everything I've got there because I bust my ass every day. And I think that's what it is. These kids have to realize nothing's going to be given to you in life. You want to play, you must earn that spot. And if you don't earn it, come to me, ask me, how coach can I get more playing time? How, what do I need to do better? But they don't. They run home. They tell mom and dad. Mom and dad write a letter. They go around. They go to your boss and they try to get them playing time that way. You know what? These kids, these kids are pretty mature nowadays and they have to learn to stand up for themselves. And when they stand up for themselves, the coach respects that. When you go to your mom and dad and your mom and dad pull you, say, listen, I had a mom pull me aside four years ago, okay? And, well, my son's not playing. Well, your son's not earning it. Your son's not working hard enough. He's not doing this. So I created, every Tuesday, I created a, a game against other teams, older teams. So these kids the, kids, the kids who don't play a lot, will get an opportunity to play in a real game. And she came out after the game and said, these games are bullshit. And I'm sitting there looking at it going, well, no other parent thinks they're, they're bullshit. They love it. So all of a sudden now, she went personal on me. She went personal on me. Then she went to my boss and tried to get me fired. And it was like, all because this kid was a good kid. He worked hard, but he just wasn't at that level where the other 16 were. So instead of working harder, she showed him there's an easy way out. We can go play on another team. So what did you teach your kid there? That's, that's where the issue is right now. Because these kids, listen, there are kids out here who are dying, dying. Listen, when you go to Argentina, you go to Brazil, either you play soccer, you play that sport, you make it or break it, or you don't know what you're going to do in life. There's no backup plan. There's no secondary plan. You live and die. If you don't make it as an athlete, you got to think, what am I going to do now? Here, we have backup plan. You have college. Division one, division two, II, division three, NAIA. So what, what's going to push that kid to work hard for his dream? You know what I mean? So it's, it's like I said, it, it, sometimes it's a little frustrating, but I love what I do. And not a lot of people can say they love what they do, but I love what I do. And you're saying exactly what I talk about in the book and we talk about on this podcast a lot, which is teaching our kids to advocate for themselves. Yes. And one of the best life skills you're going to get out of sport may not be the MLS or D1, D2, yeah. D3, but it'd be the life skills to learn that you have agency over your future. Yep. And when you ask for what you want, at least getting, it may not be the answer you want, but the honest answer of you're not working hard enough. Yep. You need to prove to me why I should play you. But those are the skills that, and the lessons that I know as parents are hard to hear. Yep but are important for our kids to learn yep. to be successful long after the ball stops bouncing, right? Listen, there's 1% of, of human society, we'll say, that are going to be professional athletes. It's just bottom line. It's, the numbers aren't very big of who's going to be a pro and who's not. So I always tell my kids, do your job and do it well. If you do your job and do it well, then you're fine. If you do your job okay, but you want to do everybody else's job, you're done. Do your job and do it well. If you do that, you've got a shot. And not, listen, not everybody's going to be a pro. But man, the life skills you learn being an athlete, how to win, how to lose, how to, how to control your emotions, the friendship you get. Listen, we tell our kids all the time, there's more than one way to become a pro. Not everybody has the same pathway. So to be a college one player, what's wrong with having a four-year career? At a division one, division two, II, division three. That's fantastic. Are you kidding me? The friends you develop, you get an education. And we all know here in the United States, education is, is huge, huge for our kids uh, because not everybody's going to be a pro. But you can always play soccer the rest of your life. I played at 56 and I still love it. I'm a pain in the ass when I'm out there because you want to win sometimes, but it, it's in you. And if you love it, you'll always be a fan of it. But uh, it's again, it's the mentality, I think, for me that that's hurting this 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 new generation of kids is the work mentality that I'm going to work my ass off to get what I want.
So if I can put on my parent hat for a second, because I love and agree with what you're saying. And on the other side, what I hear a lot, right, is our kids have are taking all these APs, they've got all this oh, homework, yeah. they've got all these these responsibilities, and coach is telling me we're gonna practice five days a week. There are no off days. We're seeing injuries rise, they're not sleeping well. Like, what's the what's how do you balance this? And and how what you know, because again, when we played, there wasn't the 24-7 yeah. always grinding. I mean, yep. we did it, but yep. but it wasn't something that was dictated to us. What's the balance? Uh, take away those damn phones. <laughs> those phones have become very dangerous. No, listen, I think the balance for me is simple. Families first. And I tell my kids all the time, because with the academy, we go pretty much sometimes we go seven days a week because we're training Monday to Friday. We have a game Saturday, Sunday. So I always tell them that family's first. If there's a family obligation, a wedding or something that's important, that's first to me. I mean, there's no if buts about it. Soccer, it's, it's a game and that's all it is. Basketball, it's a game. That's all it is. Family's there for life. You, your family, I mean, and, and people don't realize we all think we have so much time left in this world and we don't. We don't know if we're going to be here tomorrow. So I always preach family first, no matter what. If you have a family obligation, go. Number two, um, schooling. If you are not passing, if you are failing your classes, you do not belong on this field. Because at the end of the day, if you can't follow instructions at school and do the homework there, how are you going to concentrate and do what I need you to do under a structure that we want you to understand? So there, there's a few things that I think that you have to find a balance. But uh, I was watching a, a show the other day and one of the parents was talking about, and I think it might've been Julie Foudy. It might've been Julie Foudy talking about her daughter having to go to prom or to practice. I mean, is that really a question? No, no greater. Prom. Yeah. Go have fun. You're a kid. <laughs> be a kid. That's what we tell the parents all the time. Mm -hmm. Let the kids be kids. We want to push them into a sport. I get it. My dad pushed me into soccer. I get it. We're Argentinian. It's in the blood. I loved it. But I also loved basketball. I sucked at it, but I loved it. My dad let me play. He let me play football. He only let me be a kicker. But, you know what I mean? But he let me do other sports that just made me an all-around athlete. It made me appreciate everything out there. So, again, I have parents tell me all the time, yeah, Johnny's three years old, but he's really good. That's great. When Johnny's 15, 13, let's talk. Well, let's let him have fun till now. And uh, listen, everybody wants to have the next Messi, right? Everybody wants to have the next Ronaldo. And uh, I, can, I can guarantee you Messi's parents watching all of the documentaries, Maradona's parents, they didn't push him to play soccer. It came naturally. So there's always, there's always that little bit of just let your kid do what comes natural to him. But listen, I'm a dad who played soccer his whole life. Grandpa played soccer. My son played American football and he loved it. He played soccer half the year and he played American football. It pissed me off to all end because I wanted to play soccer all year round. But as a dad, I knew, I learned. And listen, we're, we're all, we all have these moments in life. I pushed my kid at 12, 13. I'm thinking, why can't he do what I did? And I pushed him and pushed him. And then one day. Did he have your talent? Um, he, you know what? He was, he's bigger than me. He's stronger than me. He was a center forward. If he would have played all year round, there's, there's no doubt he could have gone to college, maybe played Division two, Division three. But that was dad's dream. And mm -hmm. I've learned this. I pushed my dream, and I already lived my dream. I had everything I wanted. I played in three World Cups, the biggest sporting event in the world. I've played in all-star games with Maradona. I'm sitting there going like, and I pushed my kid because I wanted him to succeed in something I did. And when he was 12 or 13, I had two moms come up to me and like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? I didn't see it. You're pushing your kid to the point he doesn't want to play soccer. I got ah, it's baloney. And I turned around. I saw my son over there with his head down. I was like, holy shit. I'm like, I'm doing basically what we tell all parents not to do. Don't let your kid, don't push your kid to live your dream, which you've already lived. So I learned the hard way. He went away from soccer for about probably four or five months, and I left him alone. And I said, if you ever want to come back, there's a spot on my team. I, I promise you I will let you just have fun. 
And ever since that day, I let him come. I, he has fun. He plays it still now with his girlfriend. But it um, sometimes it takes somebody that you trust to come up to you and just have to listen. We don't want to listen. We want to hear things. We hear things, but we don't listen all the time. I listened that day, and it changed my relationship with my son dramatically. I mean, we go out and we kick the ball. We have fun now. And it was that pushing that I just, we feel that since we're athletes, professional athletes, we want our kids to do the same thing. And uh, he didn't have it in him. He wanted to have fun. I learned, let him have fun. My other son, the same thing, played one year in high school with me, and he decided to run cross country. I'm like, I love you, buddy. Do what makes you happy. And he was happy. So uh, it's, it's, it's a tough learning lesson. But when, once you see it and you learn it, 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 it definitely changed the relationship with my kids. So what other advice? This is such that's so insightful. And thank you for being so honest, <clears throat> because I think it's easy to say, you know, see other people doing that and be like, oh, no. I would never do that. And then you see yourself doing it. And you're like, oh, wow, this is a hard lesson. right? Yeah. The best experiences we have is the lessons we learn. And if we don't mm -hmm. learn those lessons that we never improve or grow as, as human beings. And mm -hmm. uh, I listen, I grew. I saw my dad. I saw what my dad did to me. And I said to myself a long time ago, I don't want to be like my dad. And I was my dad for a while. And but I learned the hard way. You know what I mean? And uh, and from there. I treat it, it is weird because I treated him like that, but I treat all the other kids like uh, not even close. I push them and push them and push them. My job is to push as because these kids want to be pros. So you can't be nice to them. You've got to treat them professionally. And I push them not to break them. I push them to bend a little bit because they have to realize that when you keep moving up the ladder, it's going to get worse. The coaches demand you to do more. Their jobs rely on their results and i mean there as the team and his at at a at a academy level results are always important because you want to teach kids the the humbleness of winning and losing at the same time but you got to prepare them for for life so you learn life lessons you get kicked out of practice you disrespect somebody you're i mean they're learning life skills through teaching them and that's what i love about it because when you're they're 18 and you see how mature these kids are, how respectful they are to other people. Like we went, I'll give you this. We went to Ireland to the Galway Cup and we were walking with the 14s and they took up the whole sidewalk and there was these four or five ladies coming. They didn't move. They didn't move. They like, they didn't comprehend that by the end of the trip, they were opening doors for people, not just women, for everybody. They were learning respect. They were learning to move to the side and let people go by but things that we don't teach anymore. I don't see kids opening doors for young ladies or, you know what I mean? Or, or anything. And I'm not, uh, listen, I'm not, men have to. It's just something we were brought up and it's just respectful for me. And I think teaching them life lessons throughout soccer, uh, I would hope when I'm 70 years old, I get these kids to come back that are having fun in Sunday leagues and say they appreciate what I did. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's all you can hope for. I remember being in Europe in 1994 and living in Budapest, Hungary, and seeing your bicycle kick on <laughs> national, on international television. I know him. Oh my gosh, I know him. And then I got the job at Nike, and I remember sitting with the Scottish guy who was a huge. Everybody was into football in Europe, yeah. right? Yeah. And them saying Americans, they don't know anything about soccer. They'll never be good on the world stage. And here we are, 30 years later, nearly. And you're talking about these academies. Talk to me about like how has that grown in the last 30 years since you've played? And and you're talking about raise. I, and I agree. Like we need to be helping develop these people into yeah. men, women, you know, into yep. women. And yep. are we seeing the Americans catch to the build to the level of of what the other the rest of the it world is doing? It, it's getting there. We're getting there. Listen, you can't compare. And people ask all the time, what, what did you see different than 30 years ago? No one gave a crap about soccer. No one really <laughs> cared about the American players. And we had the biggest sporting event in the world. And that opened up everybody's eyes in the United States, 94 days. But the biggest difference is the opportunity these kids have. When I played, it was ODP. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You didn't have anything else. You had club and ODP. And then if you're lucky enough, you got called to a youth national team if they were funding 
those teams. Nowadays, U.S. soccer is building a complex, a U.S. soccer, a U.S. national team soccer complex in Atlanta, where all the teams are going to be able to be housed. They can train there. Um, huge step. There's an under 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 23 national team. We didn't have that back then. The opportunity for these kids to go to college now from Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, um, much bigger than it was when we were playing. Academies, no one had an academy. You either played club soccer or you didn't play soccer at all. So the, the ability that we got, listen, right place, right time, back in the old days. Um, nowadays, there's so many people scouting every game, every weekend through the academy. Um, if you're on a field and there's not two scouts from U.S. soccer or MLS, I'd be shocked. Absolutely shocked nowadays with the academies. So the ability that these kids have, um, and I'm not going to say me, but the generation from Jeff Dubeck, David Vanoli, Steve Trichu, John Doyle, that 90 group to now, the sacrifices we had to make. Um, listen, we stayed in hotels that were run down. We did the U.S. soccer. We were getting, I think it was like 10 bucks a day per diem. We were getting a pair of shoes to play in. Um, you couldn't give your jersey away because we didn't have that many jerseys. So the, the funding for us to qualify for 90 was, an, I think, a miracle to begin with. And we all know Calajiri's goal. But to see what, where it's gone from 90 to 94 to 98, it's just kind of consistently grown. Um, the athlete we talk about now, the athletes have places to play. When we played in 94, no one wanted to take a chance on an American. I think it was Tab playing in Spain, Harksy playing in England. And that was really not a lot of Americans. After 94, the doors started opening. And now these kids, instead of playing in an academy at 16, 17, they're going to Europe. Christian Pulisic, Weston McKinney, Tyler Adams played in the uh, Red Bull Academy, got sold to England. You know, Matt Turner played with the New England Revolution, got sold to Arsenal. So the ability of these teams now, you know, everything about MLS and soccer, you try to make global because it is global. If you look at England, you look at soccer as the biggest sport pretty much in the world that's played in every country. And the U.S. was catching up. And then all of a sudden, over the last probably five years, now you're getting European scouts coming to 15-year-old 15, 15 games, 16-year-old games, looking for athletes, looking for these players to take them. And that's why the academies have been very lucky. They've formed these academies, and now they're playing the academy. Now the academies will sell these kids, which is fantastic because when you look at guys now that are being sold five, six million dollars from their academy to go play Euro play football in Europe at 18 years old, we didn't have those opportunities. So soccer has grown from a United States sports to a global sport now because when you go, I mean, I remember going to, a, was it um, the GA Cup? I saw scouts from Manchester United. I saw scouts from Manchester City. And you're sitting there going, you see guys from Fiorentina, from Juventus. You've got scouts now everywhere looking for talent in the United States. And there's a kid right now who's 14 years old, who's playing with the 17s in the Philadelphia Union, who's possibly going to get sold to either Man City. Manchester United, Barcelona. So I'm thinking, I mean, where have you heard that? Wow. And that's been Never. years. So the doors in, in soccer has grown so much in this country in 30 years. And we just wait, wait till 2026. And I know we're co-hosting with Mexico and Canada, but uh, there, there's a chance when you can talk about this U.S. team, if they can stay healthy, they've got a good opportunity. They're good enough, strong enough playing in some of the best leagues in the world, that this, key, this team could easily get into a quarterfinal or semifinal. So what about the pay-to-play model then? They're identifying the talent Sucks. and the aca academy will pay for it? or Well, so the pay-to-play, pay listen, oh, God. When you're paying <laughs> $3,000 a kid yeah. to play soccer all year round, um, that's not the right way to go. There's no. a lot of kids that can't afford to play soccer at that price. There's a lot of talent out there 
And uh, I think that's the biggest downfall in this country right now is the pay to play model because you're these kids all paying so everybody else can make a living. These mm -hmm. kids want to go out there and have fun. They're not going to be pros. They want to play club soccer every Saturday, be with their friends, and we're charging them three, four, five thousand dollars. And it, it, that's not that's not the way we're going to find the best athletes. Do I have the solution? No. I think everybody's trying to find it, but there's no way. I mean, listen, it would be simple. All the better players should be playing in MLS Academy teams. If you're looking to go pro, you should be playing there. You say that to the club teams, they get upset with you. You say it to this guy, they get upset with you. But at the end of the day, um, playing three, four thousand dollars a year. And what happens if you have multiple kids? Are they going to give you a discount? Great. I'm paying five thousand dollars a year for my kids to play. And they're going to play 14 games in the spring, 14 games in the fall. And maybe you got to pay extra to go to a tournament. It's just too, it's our sport was one of the most affordable sports uh, as of 20 years ago. And now it's probably one of the top ranking money sports out there because now people have realized that you've charged the kids enough, you can make a living. You got to pay for the technical director, the director of the school. You got to pay the executive director. You got to pay this. You know, our sport should not be, our sport is a beautiful sport. It's a ball and shoes. Go out there and play and it should not be being charged three to $4,000 a year to play soccer. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest questions I always get asked too, is how we're going to fix this problem. I heard the head of LA 28 talk about that's one of their biggest initiatives yeah. is giving back to, you know, actually getting more back into rec sports yep. so that these kids, because basically exactly what you just said, which is a lot of our top talent, is not yeah. rising to the top because no. they can't afford it? Yeah. And, and that's a, that's a problem. Yeah. Again, listen, once uh, the difference, I guess, nowadays, if you, and I've got a few, quite a few friends who are scouts for MLS and for U.S. soccer, when they find a kid, it's different. You're looking for a kid for the U.S. national team. There's not really a, a pay there, but we're talking about soccer in general. There's millions and millions of kids that are going to play soccer who are not looking to go pro, that are not looking to, to make a living out of soccer. They want to run out there. They like playing with their friends. We got to make it affordable for those kids to be able to enjoy themselves and mom and dad not to stress about where we're going to come up with $3,000 so they, so kids can play soccer. And uh, I'm with that. I hope somebody out there that is embedded with U.S. soccer and the national team will find a solution because what's happening now isn't a solution. I mean, it's just not, it, it's, it, you're driving kids away from the sport because of a cost of $3,000. Now shoes are $200. You know, you're looking at a $200 ball sometimes and it's like, mm -hmm. if you can make cheaper balls, which they do, it's affordable. Do you make cheaper cleats? Yes, you do. Adidas has the top, bottom, and a middle. It's affordable. At the end of the day, soccer, our sport, should be affordable to play. Uh, and I, yeah, it, it has to be more affordable for, for kids to want to play and enjoy. Yeah, and I live in Los Angeles, and $3,000 <laughs> would be actually a total bargain. Yeah. <laughs> so after three kids playing basketball and volleyball, yeah. I'm, pay I'm paying five times that per kid, which yeah. is crazy. Um, so, yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's, it's gone the wrong way. Um, Cello, I know you're so busy, and I just so appreciate you taking the time. Oh. But I have to ask one question that we ask all of our all uh -oh. of our guests here to end, <laughs> put you in the hot seat. All right. Um, you're going to nail this one because this is, this is you, but I I've, love I've, asking. I've been known to screw things up, so we're fine. <laughs> I love asking, um, and you can answer this however you want, finish this however you like, but what comes to mind when I say the best athletes I know do this? What, how would you finish that statement? Best athletes I know do this. Ooh, that's a tough one because <laughs> no, but the best athletes in the world take care of their bodies. They take care of their minds. Mm -hmm. They take care of their profession because they know it doesn't last very long. So I would say the best athletes that I know are very disciplined mm -hmm. in, in what they know what they need to do. They're very disciplined of knowing you know, what to eat, when not to eat, how much to work how much not to work after. Because when I'm talking about when you're at practice, that's part of it. It's the, 
watching the videos and studying your opponent. It's being in the gym and knowing how to push yourself. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of, you know, between stretching and yoga, there's so many things we do. I would say the best athletes I know are very disciplined and know, know what they want. I agree. I think that's a great answer because if you want to go the distance and you did, like you've got to be maniacal about your process, right? And how you show up every day. Listen, the, the, the beauty of it nowadays is, is if you look at most, we'll say professional teams now, back when I played, they didn't feed you. They didn't do anything. You had to watch yourself. Nowadays, they're feeding you breakfast, lunch, because you're there for six hours. So they're helping you um, with the nutrition, which is important. There's GPS. Remember back when we played, when we did fitness, it's like, okay, we're doing two miles a day in 12 minutes. Go! And you're like, what? And I'm like, I'm 25. He's 18. He's going to run faster than me. You know what I mean? And all those good things. I remember the Swedish obstacle course. You're sitting there going, you've got to be kidding me. So nowadays with the GPS systems we have on our kids, we can track every miles, the mm -hmm. miles, the workload, the how, how quickly they can accelerate, how many sprints they've done. And at the end, you can see the workload. If it's too much, if it's too little, and you can adjust everything. So it's a different time. It's a different era. Everything is, is, is basically with the GPS, the computers. You can do all the analytics of everything. You can watch your athlete and you can train him properly. Back when we played, it was like, okay, you have to do this. And if you can make it, then you can play. If you can't run the Cooper, then you won't play until you make it. So it's a different era. And uh, again, it's not about what you do at practice. It's what you do outside of your sport. What do you do to get better? How hard are you willing to work? You know what I mean? What extra work do you put in? And it's not PlayStation. I have kids. Well, we worked. We, we were simulating our game on, on Xbox. Yeah. Like, not. Excuse me? No. So That's the other vi vivid but, memory I have yeah. of us is at the San Diego State track. Yeah. And the men's soccer team and the women's volleyball team. And we had to run two miles in, I think, 14 minutes, 16 minutes. Yeah, we had, we had the Cooper, and two you and had 12. To, you, you had to do it in 12. And you guys were like jogging backwards and no. we were dying trying to Listen, finish. I'm going to tell you this. I've made the Cooper <laughs> one time. And the one time I made it, I literally had to dive across the line and stick my <laughs> hand out to make it. I have never made it. I get in my own head when I'm running. I can hear my breathing. It just screws with me. But yeah. when I put on a headset, and you remember the old Walkman, because it was like yeah. two pounds on your, on your <laughs> side, and it was bright yellow, and you had yeah. a little cassette in there. That's the only time I made it, because I was able to let my mind just let go. I stopped listening to breathing. I stopped letting my mind tell me things, and it just let me go, and I made it. But your mind plays tricks on you. That's the thing. It tells you it can't make, oh, your knee hurts, oh, your back sore. And that's, that's the part about it. I talk about mentality. You have to fight through some of that stuff. And at the end of the day, listen, I made it. I, I, I did enough to what I needed to do because I'm not a long distance. I'm more of a sprinter. Mm -hmm. But you got to do what you got to do to make it, man. And God knows. I don't know if I made it that day with you guys, but <laughs> I was probably about, I was probably about, probably about 13 minutes knowing me. So I just remember thinking we shouldn't be complaining. At least we don't have to do it in 12. No, <laughs> because, but I, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was rough. Well, Speaking we had, remember, mental... remember, remember Chuck Clegg, Chuck yes, Clegg at San Diego State. You had two miles in 12 minutes, or you could do three miles in 18 minutes. Everybody chose 18. And I remember one day we were running and this kid knew he was going to make it. He ran the last lap and kept <laughs> running out the gate and we never saw him again. So... Bye. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Rudy made us all do it together until we all passed. So I do remember running it multiple times, trying to help the middle blockers who couldn't run seven minute miles, like drag them across the line too. like, come on, we I can't do this yep. one more time in yep. the 85 degree weather, or whatever it was. No, yeah, rough yeah. life, 85 degree. I'm OK. Yeah, yeah. it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> San Diego, not horrible weather. Uh, I know. I love yeah. that place. Mm. Okay, sorry. One last thing you brought up yeah. mental. And I just think this is where I spend so much of my time. What do you think's changed and how, what tools are they, these athletes now getting that you're seeing from a mental 
you know, resiliency standpoint that, that you didn't get? Um, you know, we, when you look at athletes nowadays, when we were, when we were playing and we were getting to big competitions, they would bring a, bring in a psychologist, right? Okay. And that psychologist you would tell your problems to, right? And he wouldn't tell the coach, but you were able to get stuff off your chest and you felt better. It's like, okay, nowadays, most and a lot of, a lot of academies now are doing online schooling. So now they're together all day. The mentality of being able to be around your peers, not being around other people. And, you know, you're, you're around soccer people all day long. You're talking soccer. You're watching soccer. You have times with the Rev. We have a great reverend here who you can talk to, who is able to guide you, you know, because we all have, as kids, we all have uh, negative thoughts. Let's be honest. They're negative thoughts. I don't want to do this today. And we're able to walk them through certain things. You know what I mean? Kids have, um, and and let's be honest, I think now the, the biggest thing that's come out over probably since the pandemic is the, the, um, the emotional side, the, 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 um, and I'm missing the word here, the, the mental, whatever. It'll Resil- get me. Resilience. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the mental illness. We'll, we'll talk about that. A lot of things that are going on and, yeah. and kids, you've got to, you've got to be delicate with them. You know, there's a lot mm-hmm. of things in this world going on that you're trying to navigate through. And uh, when you're navigating through life, you've, you've got to be able to find, because not everything's black and white. There's gray out there. And how do you navigate through the gray? Because when you're in the black, it's dark, you're scared, you don't know what to do. How do you navigate through the gray to find happiness? How do you, find, how do you navigate through the black to see a little bit of light so you're not scared? Because if you see a little bit of light, there's hope. So the idea nowadays is to help them through life. And I mean, navigating school is difficult, navigating, um, you know, everything that's going on, because a lot of things that kids were able to say back in the old days, you can't say nowadays. And it's very offensive, um, nicknames. Um, So the idea, again, is, is, is how do we help these kids navigate their way through that gray? So they realize there's happiness in the gray, you just have to find it. And the happiness Maybe it's being outside juggling a ball by yourself. Maybe it's not playing a little 5v2 with your friends. Maybe it's just going on a hike. I take my kids, every team I've had, I take them on a hike. Every year, I take them on a hike up in the mountains with me because the beauty, the, the serenity, the quietness, the spiritualness you find up there, it, it just, I don't know, it puts a smile on my face. And, uh, and, and I know that when they're up there, they're like, God, this is a new experience coach. We've never done this. Exactly. Exactly. Finding little things that just puts a smile on your face. Cause we're not always happy. This, despite what social media says, our lives aren't that happy. We know that it's the dark times, the sad times. How can I navigate through that and find some happiness? And that's, that's hopefully what we can help the kids with nowadays. I like to say getting out of your head and into your body. So that's go take a hike, go get in yeah. nature, yeah. go do, go, go to the ocean, go to the mountains, where, wherever it is that you find some yeah. just tranquility about. Yep. And then yep. asking yourself, what is it that I want and why do I want it? Because to your earliest point, which is if it's your parents' dream, yeah. but it isn't yours, yeah. that it's time to look deeper inside of what it is you want. Yeah. And it's okay if it's not soccer or it's basketball. It's got to be realistic, though. You know, everybody yeah. says they want to be a professional athlete. That's not realistic. I mm-hmm. hate to say it. I'm not, bust, I'm not busting anybody's dreams. But not everybody's going to be a professional athlete. It's just, mm-hmm. not, it's just not possible. So, but like me, I never made the national team. That was a no. dream of mine, yeah. but I got to work for Nike and I'm like, gosh, to be able to do something, it was, it was tangential to that dream, exactly. you know, exactly. and having those, that's why I say, go for it. Have your kids yeah. say that's what they want to do because yeah. the skills and the, the work ethic and the getting comfortable being uncomfortable, if that isn't truly what they want they will grow that muscle and that's the muscle that's going to help them figure out ultimately where it is they want to be. Exactly. As I said before, everybody has a talent in this world. You got to find it. You got to find it. Listen, 
I tell everybody, fight. I have a kid who I've known since he was 10 years old. He is 25 now and he's still trying to be a pro. He works every day, every day. And uh, I will never tell him to give up because it's his dream. You fight as long as you can, as hard as you can to live that dream. Eventually, you know what you'll realize, I, you know, yay, nay, life will tell you. Mm -hmm. But every day, listen, you don't have to have a dream to be a professional athlete. You can dream to be a doctor, a lawyer, a, a whatever, a, a maintenance guy. Yes, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. But do something that you love to do because you're going to do it the rest of your life. And if you love it, God, man, life is so good. Life is so good. It's when you get put into a job that you're not overly thrilled with. That's when you get all gloomy and grumpy. So but we always tell the kids, fight. Fight for what you want and don't give up until you get it. Because once you get it, life's pretty good, man. Life's pretty good. And speaking of love, I know you still get to do what you love by announcing. So could you tell everybody where they can find you and follow you if you happen to speak no, Spanish? I'm not going to tell them <laughs> because then they'll write me on Twitter and they'll beat me up. And so I'm not, no, it's, it's easy. I work for Apple TV. I've been very blessed. I worked for the uh, Rapids TV. I've done 17 years. And then last year, uh, Apple came in and bought the whole league and made it a global sport now global league so you can catch it anywhere in the world under apple tv and uh, i'm blessed enough to be able to do spanish tv which i take a lot of abuse but it's okay <laughs> because well because because i'm american and i like to show oh. off my u.s jerseys and when you represent the united states and you speak spanish the yeah. latinos like to stick it to me a little bit it's fine <laughs> i'm okay with that i have a good time but it's great it's great i work with jorge navarro perez and oh, yeah. uh, you can catch us every weekend on apple tv Oh, well, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been, honestly, as I said, it's true. You are in the top 100 and you were not 91. <laughs> I got to bust your chops a little bit. I haven't seen you in a long time. So, you know, I know. But, uh, right. but thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Parents, if you like this, please follow, share, like, uh, Buy the book, Raising Empowered Athletes. All, almost 99% of what he said today was stuff that we talk about in the book and on the podcast all the time. So it's wonderful to hear from a former pro and current pro who continues to, to lead and grow and show us how, how we do it all. So thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Let's do this. Hello. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, then you know I love trying new things because that's how we get better. So we're adding in a new little feature here to the end of this episode, and we'd love to hear your feedback. If you like it, if it's valuable, then let us know because then we'll keep doing it. So I have Matt McGonigal here, and we're going to do a little recap of what we heard in the episode with Marcelo Balboa. Cool. Well, Kirsten, I'm excited to try this. This is something new that we haven't gotten to do yet. And, uh, you know, give, give a good summary for everybody who's listening to the podcast and at the end of it, see how it can relate to raising their own athletes or being an athlete or being a better person. So it's going to be really exciting. Yes. The, um, so, yeah, some of the points that Marcelo had, like one thing that we definitely saw in this podcast was how big of a role his father played in the, um, you know, being a former pro and raising him as a soccer player and as a person. And I think one of the most fascinating points, and tell me what you thought about it, was the his dad was definitely very much tough love. And Marcel did not hold back in telling us that. What are your thoughts on how that, you know, turned him into the athlete that he was and into the to the person that he ended up becoming? Yeah, I think we see this particularly generationally, um, in the era that I was raised in, in the 70s and 80s, there were definitely more parents that either were, it felt, it feels like looking back on it, either super hands off or super intense. And that's happening today as well. But from Marcelo's background, his dad being a former pro, um, being an immigrant, um, coming from another country and needing to work for everything that he got, he had a mindset around there was just one way to do things. And, um, and that, that was what he, he learned and, and grew from. And then he realized he had some headwinds academically to try to get into schools and physically, he, you know, he had the skills, but he didn't have necessarily the academics, but 
he, his dad pushing him to be the best version of himself was um, kind of always the underlying theme. Yeah. And one thing that you mentioned there and a quote that he had in his podcast was, if it wasn't for sports, I would have failed out. And what do you think about, you know, for kids who are in that, you know, there's a lot of athletes in that position. And how do you encourage your athletes and the people you work with to balance both the athletic side as well as the um, academic side? And where, where are you, where, what are your suggestions for time management and everything that comes in play with that? So there's far more money available for academics than there are for athletics. Far more, much more money. And I think that's the part that gets misconstrued or misunderstood is that the parents start setting their goals to getting the full ride scholarship and don't, and you know, maybe whatever, take their eye off the ball or say, we don't really need to worry about the grades. But what I've seen is the coaches that say, if you have the great GPA, you know, I can find you some money, maybe again, not D1, but a D2, if you have the grades. And then even the D1s, there are certain schools where I can't get you into my school. Like they'll literally start with your your GPA. And if you don't hit a certain number, they can't even talk to you. So you only put yourself in a better position to get more money and to get recruited by having a higher GPA. Yeah. And on for my own personal recruiting process, I experienced the same thing. I walked into my junior year, I had schools looking at me and it was the ones that were my reach schools athletically that were unfortunately out of reach because, you know, I might be right there, like, you know, between me and another guy and there's always someone that you're competing with. And if it's, you know, talent wise and everything else is even platform, they're going to take the person who's going to cost that program less money and different sports have different money. But for soccer, at least we only had 9.9 scholarships maximum at the division one level to be spread out across 30, sometimes 40 people. So in order to secure some of that scholarship, you have to be able to go outside of, you know, athletics. They don't want to be coaches, no matter how good you are, you could be the best player they've ever recruited. They'll still look for academic money for you in order to get another good player to benefit you. Yeah. So the, uh, the academic side is definitely a massive part of it. And I think Marcelo did discuss that, uh, you know, how he encourages his players as a coach and going on that, like, what did you, what were your thoughts on his coaching style and how he, you know, trains his academy and trains his 14 year olds, like they're 18 year olds is the way he put it and trains them like pros. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure he rubs some parents the wrong way because he has a very, you know, hard line about how he wants to, to, to lead. And I respect that. I think, um, as a parent, I, if, if the coach is hard on my kid, I don't have a problem with it as long as he's fair. Yeah. And he's able to articulate where his line is, the struggles that, and, you know, now I'm almost on the other side of it, but with raising my three, it was when a coach didn't give reasons, didn't give expectations, and then did made changes and didn't give feedback, just iced you. Like that was the hardest part. But if you're going to say, for example, if you want playing time, you need to be at every single practice. You miss a single practice. You're going to sit on the bench for a week. Okay, great. We know now. Like, and then you get to make a choice. Do we want to go on the vacation or not? But at least you know, and then it's okay as the athlete, you go, okay, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the parent and the athlete struggle because the kid doesn't want to go to grandma's for Thanksgiving. He'd rather stay and, and play. But you're making a choice as a family, and then you you can then deal with the consequences. I think the harder part is when somebody who says, I'm really, really tough you know, and just, but doesn't tell them what the expectations are and then doesn't explain why you're not getting playing time. Yeah. And that was for me uh, growing up as well. Like the best coaches were the most honest coaches. They weren't the coaches that, you know, I actually thrived in a coach that set the bar up here and pushed you to meet the bar, but you knew where that bar was. And when you fell short, they were going to let you know. And for me, that was the encouragement I needed. I didn't want my coach to be my best friend. I had plenty of friends. I wanted my coach to be able to push me. And it was the ones who I didn't understand where I stood that made it really difficult to to thrive with them. And coach, if you're a coach listening to this, like I would say 
getting clear on what your expectations are so that you can put those out up front because if they know if they don't, you know, you can't cha be changing the rules. And that's what happens too is, well, Johnny, who's my best player, he can, you know, go to Disneyland for the day and he still gets to play the next day. But Tommy, who's not as good, he, you know, he's sick and misses a practice and now he doesn't, he doesn't get any reps. And I think that's the part that really frustrates parents is when the rules are the rules for some people, but not for everyone. So. Yeah. And I, you know, he, he went into how the coaching and his dad, you know, affected him as a parent and pushing his kid as a pro dad and had to, some parents went out of their way to be honest and open with him and put him in check a little bit of, you know, where are you pushing your kid to? And I yeah. found that to be, you know, fascinating that he, he was able to, you know, in my experience, parents don't seem to like it when you tell them how to parent. So <laughs> being open, being open to somebody else coming to him and saying, what are you doing here? You're pushing your kid in the wrong direction. And he started, it sounded like he started to parent a lot more with love and less with a hard line. And that was, yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think we're, we, we usually recreate what we know, right? So the, that, that would be the default is this is how I'm, I was parented. This is how I'm going to parent you. But the higher, more evolved parent, again, I don't think there's a single parent out there that's like, let me screw up my kid. Of course not. But what we do go is, gosh, this is what I know. This is what's familiar to me. I'm going to continue to do this. But if you can look and see your kids in pain and, you know, the kid who never never has the bag packed the night before, who not, doesn't want to get in the car, who's, you know, never going out in the backyard to kick the ball around. Those are signs that maybe this isn't his thing or her thing. Maybe this is more my thing. And, and being aware of that. And then I say have 90 one minute conversations with your kid. Hey, I'm just checking in with you. I know we're only two months into the season. It doesn't seem like you're really enjoying this. How's it, how's it feeling for you? doesn't mean we're going to quit. doesn't mean like, oh yeah, I don't like this. I'm out. But what it means is you're checking in with them regularly so that they can feel like they're owning the process. And yeah. at the end of the season, this isn't what I want to do anymore. I really like guitar. I'm going to go play guitar. Okay, great. Let's make a decision as a family that we're going to pivot away from this, but allowing them, the child, the athlete to feel like they get a vote. <laughs> yeah. And teaching that there's a difference between quitting and walking away and showing that there's, you know, you're middle of the season, your teammates are relying on you and you fall out of love with the game. Well, you still owe something to your teammates because you started something and it's understanding now that your parents have that understanding of you are no longer in love with the sport and you want to go a different way. Now, as a parent, you can guide your kid into this is how you leave something in a respectful manner. This is how you give your coach a heads up. This is how, you know, you wait for the right exit route and you don't quit. You take ownership of your own path. And that's where the guidance comes into play of like, it's not just walking away from something because you're not playing or because it's not the right situation for you. It's a compromise. And it's, I think those are really important skills that, that sports teach as well. And then when you go to pivot, what is it you're interested in? It's a research project. I don't know. Maybe it's not a competitive sport. Maybe it's rock climbing or surfing or skateboarding. But what we want are athletes for life. Kids who see themselves as I want to be physically active because I know when I get my, my heart rate up and I sweat and I have the endorphins going, I feel better. Yeah. And so not everybody comes out of the you know womb like Caitlin Clark, knowing that they want to play at the, at the highest level. And that's okay. Yeah. That's not and, the Yeah, it it teaches it teaches kids that they don't have to be the best player in the world. They can be, be the best guitar player that they can be. Yes. Don't be the best, do your best. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that those are again these are just constant lessons that we can learn from sports that translate directly into life. And it, it, it's nonstop the amount of information that people aren't paying attention to because it's the it's it's the outside that focuses, you know, that really develops the personality down the road. Yeah. yeah. Let's see what else 
And the last thing I think he discussed was a bit about U.S. soccer and how the pay-to-play system, how in other sports, I only really know as much about soccer, but what do you think about these pay-to-play systems for kids and how much it costs per sport per kid? It's bro- it's broken and it's getting worse. It's a $35.5 billion business right now that's projected to be a $40, $50 billion business in the next six years. Um, there are now private equity groups buying out companies that will then invest even more into youth sports. And unless we start prioritizing rec, I was just down actually with an athletic director from a middle school, and he said, none of my kids, it's K through eight. He said, all of the kids are only playing club. I can't even get them to go out for the school team anymore. And you know, if as a fourth grader, you feel like, well, I have to be playing club, then you're not going to try anything new because you're going to feel like the pressure to already be good at eight or nine or 10. And that, as we know, is ridiculous. Like you don't even know what you're interested in yet. So we need to allow grassroots sports to come back. We need to be doing more in the YMCA and, um, you know, that kind of space, the after school program space so that kids can, can play and, and focus on fun and not, as I like to say, friends, fun and fundamentals. We've gotten so far off that path. Um, not everybody needs to be on a, on a track to, to going club, to be going pro, to be going whatever they think they're going. Um, really, we need more kids that are, that are just experimenting because that's yeah. what childhood is about. And not limiting opportunities in other, for other kids as well. Because there's a lot of kids who, unfortunately, they can't afford it. And now they're looking for scholarships. And now their opportunity is limited compared to kids who have, you know, not every family has $5,000 to spend on a, on a sport right. and travel and do that. So it is limiting opportunity as well, which is sad to see. But, yeah. the, uh, uh, you know, and encouraging uh, sports should be available for everybody because they're beneficial to everybody. And it yeah. teaches so many things. Yeah. And we want every access for all. So yeah, that's, you know, I think what I'm going to be spending now my time really focusing on is how do we open that aperture to get more kids involved at, at a young level. And again, not, not about the idea of getting them to college, but just to getting them involved so that we can be healthy. We, with 70% of kids of all ages, of all genders are dropping out of sport by age 13. There's something wrong with the system. Yeah. They should be key because they feel like there's not opportunity there for them. The opportunity is the is the process. It's the the opportunity is the act of doing it. It's not the the college scholarship. It's not the it's not those can be goals within it, but the people who really reach those goals are the ones who fall in love with the process of it. And every kid should have the opportunity to fall in love with the process, even if they're not good enough to make it to pro. You never know. And they that shouldn't necessarily be everybody's goal. It should just be the goal of enjoyment and the goal of living a happy and healthy lifestyle. Being and being a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Cool. Well, this is fun. Uh parents, coaches, athletes, anyone who's listening, we again we'd love to hear your feedback. What were your takeaways from listening to, to Cello and and his experience and um and how does it jive with how you're parenting? I think again, the goal here is to shine lights on things that you may go, gosh, I am doing that. Oh, I, I could make a different choice, or maybe I need to start doing doing more of this. You know, like I love to watch you play is all I need to say in the car. Like, gosh, you've been playing soccer for eight years and you just don't seem to love it anymore. Should we have a conversation about what you would like to do next? Because that's the gift that we can do to support our athletes and making sure that they're enjoying the journey. So thanks for listening, um, and we hope to see you soon. Let's do this. Mm-hmm.